made them brothers, as true blood brothers. Hamza and Zaid both came from Mecca. And this was the exception. The Prophet ﷺ made them brothers and not from the people from Medina of Ansar. So Zaid ibn Hath is claiming now, this is my niece. Because I'm the brother of Hamza, she should be with me. The Prophet ruled والسلام, that she should be given to Ja'far because her aunt is the wife of Ja'far. And then the Prophet والسلام, softened their hearts so that they would not be angry. And he said, Ali, may Allah be pleased with him. You're from me and I'm from you, which is very close. And he said, Ja'far, you resemble my character and my looks as well. You look like me and your character of kindness and bravery, etc., are like me as well. And he said to Zaid that you are our brother and our mawla, our ally, our freed slave. So now in the issue of custody, what is the rule? Scholars have discussed this a lot and nothing is so authentic and strong that one can say, this is it. This is the decision. One of the main evidences used is when a woman came to the Prophet ﷺ and she said that my husband divorced me and he wants to take my child away from me. And the Prophet said ﷺ, no, the child is yours until you get married. But this hadith, some scholars make it Hassan, which is authentic, the lowest levels of authenticity. And some say that it is Daif, it is weak. Regardless, this is what is being mainly applied. If the child is below seven years of age, he should remain with his mother until she gets married. If she's not married, then he remains with her. And they differed whether it's a male child or a girl. If it's a female after seven years of age, they say that it is the right of the husband to take her because this is his honor, his reputation, and he fears over her more than the mother. And the most authentic opinion is that yes, she remains or he remains with his or her mother until she gets married. If she's not married, then she has the right to have their custody. The issue is that sometimes it is the judge who rules because the judge has the power to enforce who gets the custody and who does not. Sometimes a person divorces his wife, his wife takes care of the children and she gets the right of custody of the children, but she is not up to it. She is not a righteous woman. She has boyfriends, she goes and parties, she gets men into her house. So is it right to say that yes, she has the right of custody? No. In this case, she has to submit and give the children to someone who is more worthy. And who is more worthy and who judges this? The Muslim judge or the Imam of the Islamic center, he looks into it. If the husband complains and says, she doesn't take care of my children, every other week they go to the hospital sick or burnt or injured, she abuses my children. So he rules that she must submit the children to someone else. Who is that someone else? Scholars differ immensely and greatly. Some say it goes to the husband, the father. Others say, no, it goes to the mother of the father, not to the father, because the grandmother, the paternal side, is more capable of taking care. And others say, no, she goes to the grandmother of the maternal side. So. It's a long debate between scholars. The most authentic opinion is that the child is to be given to the most suitable for him or for her. So if it's the mother who is unmarried, this is her right. But if she is not fit to take care of him, whether it's financial, whether it's uh, mental, then it is the right of the father to take responsibility. If he is not fit, then the closer to the father's side. So the grandmother from the father's side. If she's not fit, then the grandmother from the mother's side and the closer they come to the child, the better. Now, having said that, a lot of problems in the West 
result through custody cases. So many times we see divorce taking place and what happens afterwards is shameful. If the kids are with the father, he would never allow them to see their mother. And if the kids are with the mother, she would make a restraint order so that the husband, her ex-husband, would not come and see his children. And this is haram. Islamically, this is unacceptable completely. No matter how bad the marriage was, yet still the children must have equal right to see their parents, whether the father or the mother. And this is something that people should fear Allah in. Moving on to the following chapter. And if you have questions, you may ask them when we, inshallah, open the floor for questions. Hadith number 337. We want someone to read that for us. Yes, sir. Abdullah ibn Masood reported, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as saying, it is not permissible to take the life of a Muslim who testifies that there is no God worthy of being worshipped but Allah and I am the Messenger of Allah except in one of the three cases, the married adulterer, a life for life and the deserter of his deen, Islam, abandoning the jama, the majority. Now this hadith inaugurates the chapter that deals with qisas and this is the equality in punishment so linguistically if someone does something to you it's part of being even that you do the same thing to him so if someone swears at you he says you're a donkey so you say you're a donkey and not exceed if he says you're a dog you're allowed islamically to say you're a dog now this is an insult by the way Unfortunately, in the so-called civilized world, they consider this as a compliment. So one would say to his friend, you're my dog. And he says, yes, I'm your dog. If you want to be a dog, be my guest. You're a dog. In Islam, we, this is an insult to say to someone that he's a dog. So to be even is permissible in Islam. However, to forgive and pardon is a higher grade. If you punish, Allah says, if you are punished, you may punish as you were punished. Do not exceed because this is transgression. And in this first hadith, the Prophet ﷺ is highlighting to us three topics or issues or sins that allow the ruler to take the life of an individual. So this is a punishment. What are these things? This is what we'll find after the break. So stay tuned. Let's discuss issues. Welcome to Let's Talk. I'm your moderator. I'm your moderator. Omar Dunlap. Does Islam allow terrorism? This is unfair and this is not true. Not Dr. True. Mamduh Muhammad. It's Islam is the religion. Islam is the religion. Because of the media, because of what's said about Islam. Mahmoud Atiya. A huge amount of literature was written on the issue of what they call Islamic terrorism or fundamentalism is not a religious reason. It is a political, sociological. Let's share ideas. Let's discover the truth. We need to put our hands together to show the mainstream the Islam, mainstream to, people. Islam to people. To clear doubts, discuss problems, and find proper conclusions. A unique and contemporary chat show. Let's talk every Thursday at 3 p.m. and repeat telecast at 1 a.m. India on Peace TV. Tawheed is Noah's Ark. Whoever embarks will be delivered, and whoever refuses will be among the losers. Tawheed is the key of paradise, and the only way to salvation. To attain eternal bliss, to attain never-ending life, get in on the Ark, hold on tight, 
and never let go. Watch as Sheikh Salim Al Amri explains the basics of Islamic belief and worship in Back to Basics every Thursday at 10 p.m. and repeat telecast at 10 a.m. India on Peace TV. Peace TV presents over 100 million viewers at one of the largest peace conferences in the world addressing a sea of spellbound spectators over 30 world-renowned orators on Islam with credentials impeccable. The truth of Islam. Deen is your way of life. It is our duty, our obligation. By following the Quran and Sunnah, we will give the message to one and all. To one and all. With articulation exquisite. Read the book of Allah. Islam is the easy way. It's the simple way. Remind each other. The Muslim is not a source of harm for other people. Collaborate with the people for good. This is the call of Islam. With the mission of spreading the truth of Islam. Do what you can to spread the word of Islam. Wherever we are, live like Muslims. Use your power. Allah is saying, why do you need anything else? This Quran is self-sufficient. The only book on the face of the globe, the Quran. How a human being should lead his life is given in this instruction manual, manual the, glorious Quran. the glorious Quran. For peace to prevail on earth in peacemakers, Next on Peace TV. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. The hadith indicates three sins. The first one that the Prophet mentioned alayhi salatu salam is adultery. In Islam, it is not permissible to kill another Muslim unless he performs or he falls in these three sins. First one, adulterer, who is married or was previously married or was widowed, whatever. Any person who got married at one point at his life, whether he's still married or divorced or widowed, this person, whether he, it's a he or a she, if committed adultery and this was proven, either through confession or through four witnesses, the penalty for that would be stoning to death. This is an Islamic punishment. One would say stoning is a barbaric way of taking life, and this is unacceptable. We say to them, this is unacceptable to you. But us Muslims, this is in our religion. And if you compare our religion to your religion, you will find that stoning is there even in the Bible. However, Islam limits stoning to one sin, and that is a person who was married at one point in his life and commits adultery, meaning that he tasted Allah's favor and blessing upon him of having a wife, yet he goes to haram means. In the Bible, if you go to the Old Testament, you will find that stoning is mentioned in a number of sins. For example, shirk, whoever commits it is stoned. We have no problem with that. Whoever commits adultery in the Bible is stoned, married or unmarried. Whoever curses the king, and this is political, huh? he is also stoned to death. Whoever disobeys his parents, the elders of the village would take him to the borders of the village and stone him to death for just disobeying his parents. Even animals are not exempted. If a bull kills a person, the bull would be stoned to death. All of this is mentioned in the Bible. If a fortune teller says or claims to know the future, he's to be stoned to death. And this is not like Islam. Islam only limits it to that heinous sin that would mean mixing the lineages, it would mean mixing the relationship between families because of that major sin. Second is when a person kills a person, and this is why the hadith is mentioned in the chapter that deals with equality and punishment. So it is life for a life. And we mentioned before that killing is divided into how many types? Three types, deliberate, semi-deliberate, and accidental. So when do we have this a soul for a soul, a life for a life, only in the deliberate. The semi-deliberate, we do not allow or we do not execute 
the killer. A deliberate means of killing is when you shoot someone, when you throw someone with an arrow or a spear that penetrates and that kills. This usually kills. So this is deliberate killing. If you put poison in someone's food, if you drown someone, if you suffocate him, put him on fire, this usually kills. So this is deliberate killing. Semi-deliberate killing is when you throw someone with a small stone and he dies. Usually this doesn't kill. If you punch someone and he dies, this usually does not kill. If you, for example, frighten someone, you come from behind someone in the middle of the dark, say, boo, and they say, oh, he dies. This usually doesn't kill. So this is semi-deliberate. There is no execution, but he has to pay the blood money or what's known as the diya. And by mistake, we've talked about that before, is like when you're driving, an accident takes place and someone dies. This is neither deliberate nor semi, it's an accident and it has its ruling. Uh, the third type of sin is when someone commits an act of apostasy or he leaves the religion, changes his religion, does something that goes out of the jama'at, the jama'at of the Muslims, as in the case who disbelieves in the Quran or in something in the Sunnah that has no excuse for him to disbelieve in. Sorcerers are the same. If a sorcerer is caught, he's executed because he cannot be a sorcerer without worshipping jinn. In this case, the act of apostasy is punished by execution. And these are only to be taken or executed by the Muslim ruler, not for you and me. It is not for a community to decide that, okay, this person has committed the act of adultery, we will purify him and stone him. If they're living somewhere that is governed by un-Islamic rules. No, this only can be done after prosecution, after a trial, after a panel of judges agree and approve of that. Then they go to the ruler, the Muslim ruler, who gives the green light to go on or he declines, depending on his findings and his inquiries. So this is one of the most important things that people should adhere to. The following hadith, hadith number 338, we need someone to read it. Who's got, yes. Abdullah ibn Masood reported, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa as saying, the first thing that will be judged among people on the day of judgment will pertain to bloodshed. Now this again is related to the chapter of Qisas. Maybe you will not be punished for what you have done in this life, but Allah Azza wa Jal does not forget. So you will be held accountable on the day of judgment. And the Prophet here says, alayhi salatu salam, that the first thing that would be judged between people would pertain to their bloodshed. And this hadith is related to things that are between the Muslims, between the people. But when it comes to individual deeds, what is the first thing that would be questioned and held accountable for in the day of judgment? Is prayer. So don't be confused. Prayer is between you and Allah. This is the first thing that you would be held accountable for. But between the rights and obligations between you and others, the first thing you would be held accountable for is bloodshed. Why did you hit that brother and made him bleed? Why did you kill that person? Why did you fight? So it highlights the issue that it is extremely dangerous to the extent that one would rather be very careful when it comes to bloodshed, not like what we see today. You're driving the car, someone says something to you, he gives you a finger, you give him a fist, and then you stop the car and start fighting and hitting one another and thinking that he deserves it. You will be held accountable for that on the day of judgment, even if you beat him, and even if he beats you you will be held accountable for this bloodshed on the Day of Judgment. We open the floor for Q&A if you have any questions. Yes, Safi. My question is regarding the earlier chapter regarding the suckling. My question is, if there's a boy, he suckled by one or more mother, so all the foster brothers will be regarded as foster brothers. Has he been suckled five known meals or shared? Shared. For if example. shared and they don't share the same husband, he is not related to any of them. See, I'll give you two scenarios. One, a boy suckles from family A, 
five times or more, and also circles from family B five times or more. Automatically, he has two mothers through suckling, and all those related to these women are related to him because he is considered to be the son of both. The second scenario is if a man has two wives and one wife, both of them pregnant, and they are breastfeeding their children. One wife breastfed a child three times, and the other one fed the same child twice. In this case, the child becomes the son of the husband through suckling, but he does not have mothers in suckling because three is not enough for her and two is not enough for her. But for the man, he became his son, and these women become his stepmothers. All the children of the man are his brothers, and the girls are his sisters. Any more questions? If a man kills someone in a state of intoxication, does he be accountable? This is a question that scholars differed upon. If someone makes a sin while in the state of intoxication, would he be held accountable? We have two types of account, one in this dunya and one at the side of Allah Azza wa Jal. So you can cascade this to everything else. If someone divorces his wife while in the state of intoxications, does the divorce take place or not? If someone does this or that, scholars differ. And the most authentic opinion is that it does not take effect in the sense that divorce, freeing a slave, buying or selling does not take place of a person when he is intoxicated. But when it comes to killing, if a person kills another while intoxicated, he might not be sinful for killing, he's sinful for drinking, and he has to be punished for his doing. Because in this case, we can easily kill people and say, I was intoxicated, so you have no right to kill me a soul for a soul. No, if someone kills someone deliberately, whether intoxicated or not, he has to be punished for that. And what is the punishment? We will get to know, inshallah, this in coming programs. This is all the time we have. Until we meet next time, fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.